Okay, so everyone, welcome to another session of MLFL. And this week, we are very excited to have Yunzu Lee. Uh, Yunzu is a PhD student at MIT, uh, advised by Professor Antonio Toralba and Professor Russ Tedrick. He works at the intersection of computer vision, machine learning, and robotics, and is particularly interested in enabling robots to better perceive and interact with the world by a learning based dynamic modeling and multimodal perception. He is a recipient of the Adobe Research Fellowship, and his research has been published in a number of top venues like Nature and Neurip CVPR. It has also been featured in a number of media outlets. Before coming to MIT, he received his BS degree in, in, uh, from Peking University, and he has also spent some time at the Stanford AI Lab and the NVIDIA Robotics Research Lab. So without further ado, let's get started. So, so if people have questions, you can use the raise hand option or post them on the chat. And I will periodically look over the chat and the participant list and, and, and let you un, uh, and, and, and interrupt Yunzu whenever required. Okay, Yunzu, you can get started, yeah. Thank you, Kapesh, for the awesome introductions. And also, thank you for inviting me here. I'm really excited to be here to present some of the work that I've been doing for the past few years during my PhD. And the title is Learning-Based Dynamics Modeling for Physical Inference and Model-Based Control. Uh, I've prepared a slides for a little bit about me, but I guess Kapesh has already given the introduction, so I'm skip the slides. Um, the motivation under behind many of my research projects, um, I mainly want to enable the robot to better perceive and interact and move in the world. And when you see a, a recent progress in the robotics fields, in, in many certain like sub areas, robots have actually unpair or surpass human performance. For example, if you see this humanoid robot jumping onto these uh, little boxes and perform backflips, this is always an awesome video to see. And this is quite an achievement of both the software and the hardware parts, as well as for self-driving. The cars can have reasonably good perception of the environment around us and can drive um, in, by maintaining like reasonable safety. In these areas, robots have actually shown human level or actually uh, close to human level performance. But what about robot manipulations? First, let me see, let us see like a few videos of humans performing manipulation tasks where we are cracking eggs, placing butter on the bread or making dough or making sushi. We are constantly dealing with like unstructured environments where the world around us are in generally uh, unknown, partial observable, and we have to deal with objects of different materials, sometimes even with novel objects. But how people in the robot manipulation community actually approach this kind of problems. Usually people can come up with two recipe. The first one is trials and error. That's what deep, deep reinforcement learning or more precisely model free reinforcement learning is doing. People do a lot of trials and errors in the environment and adjust the policy such that it can slightly uh, 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 closer to the policy that can give you higher rewards. This kind of approach has been very successful in uh, game domains where people are playing Go, playing Alpha Star, playing, playing uh, Dota. In this kind of domains, um, it is very safe and actually reasonably efficient to get vast amount of data from the simulators for the policy to learn. But in the real world, we do not really have that kind of luxuries where uh, we have to think a lot about our physical constraints. Like we cannot sample a lot of things in parallel and we also have to uh, care about safety issues. And this is not how human do tasks. When we're facing a new task or some new objects, we do not really need to do a lot of trials and error with the object in order to do some manipulation tasks. Maybe with some practice, but usually uh, far less samples uh, compared to model free reinforcement learning. And the other direction would, would be to really write down analytical equations of the physics, to use our knowledge of the physics F equals MA, to build a very accurate model of the environment. This kind of approach has also been very successful in domains like, as you, as you have seen the video, like Boston Dynamics, where they build a very accurate models of the robots in order to do uh, control with, as well as, for example, plane, rockets, people build accurate models in order to do the tasks. But can this be applied to manipulation domain? Um, since a little bit stopped here, 
because we are facing environments where we don't even know how we should represent. For example, if we want to represent the clothes, how do we represent it? Representing the human or the robots will be straightforward, where you have to assign like joints, uh, the location, the inertia of the joints and the links and joint angle joint torques. Those kind of things can be measured using sensors. But what about object in the wild? For example, in the, for, for the clothes, how do we represent the clothes? And for a lot of tasks, we do not really need a complete representation. For example, if we want to butter our shirts, we only need some local observations in order to accomplish the task without have to fully understand all the information in the environment. But you want to use physics, you have to know the full state in order to simulate the futures. So these kind of challenges prevent uh, many like physics-based models to apply in the real world. And in general, this is also not how we human do tasks. When we push an object, when we uh, do some manipulation tasks, we do not have to constantly thinking about the physical equations in our minds. Instead, we have a very strong intuitive uh, physics engine in our minds. We can predict how the environment is gonna change if we apply a specific actions. We learn this kind of abilities purely from interactions through our whole life. All, all the way when we were very young, we will be able to understand uh, the when we do some actions, how the environment change, how we may be able to stack some towers. And <clears throat> this kind of abilities doesn't require a lot of uh, extensive amount of trials and error. Also doesn't uh, require our constant thinking of F equals MA. Instead, we directly learn from visual observation have some representations in our mind, and we use this kind of representation to build a predictive model. This kind of predictive model can help us solve a lot of inverse problems, uh, for example, manipulation. And more, more precisely, when we compare with model-free reinforcement learning, it has better generalization, easier to specify goal, and also to achieve some new goal, and it also has better sample efficiency. When we compare with analytical physics model, we can handle cases where the underlying dynamics is uncertain or unknown. And it can also <clears throat> more straightforwardly apply to partial observable scenarios because we directly learn from observation. Let me make the problems more uh, concrete. We're solving an optimization problems where we are want to minimize the cost over some time horizon. And it is subject to some dynamics uh, constraints as well as we're coming up with some control signals uh, using some policy functions. And we want to operate, the, for example, the robot arm to manipulate like object in the wild with a lot of like messy objects. In order to solve this kind of uh, questions, we have to be very precise and thinking very deeply about what each components inside this framework means and how we can approach them. First, we have to think about how we should come up with a suitable state representation such that we can operate on. The state representation usually consists of two parts, like the state of the robots, as well as the state of the world. State of the robot is usually very straightforward. You can just raise some the, 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 the joint sensors to, and also the, the kinematics of the robot to understand the states. But usually the key is how we can represent the world around us. And given this kind of representation, how we may be able to build a dynamics model that is that may have a lot of trade-off to make. For example, it has to um, capture enough information such that we can uh, perform reasonable task ways. And also it, it may have to be somewhat like interpretable such that you can specify new goal or reuse this kind of sub-modules. This kind of thinking also have to be playing into a part of what should be the model class uh, for different like state representation. And finally, given the state, given the dynamics model, it doesn't mean like the problem is solved. Like for example, if you have a close and you know the full state of the close and you can simulate the close, coming up with a policy that can fold the close is still a very challenging problem. And how we can come up with policies to solve some specific uh, manipulation task is also something we have to keep in mind with. The first state representation um, I'm, I'm gonna share with you was is to use particles. Uh, this is actually some of my early attempts uh, during my PhD. I want to use particles to represent the object around us. Particles are very general and flexible for representing objects of different materials. For example, here we show fluids, rigid body, and all, as well as deformable objects. And we represent like each one of the particles as a node 
in the in a graph and using graph neural networks to learn the interaction between different particles. Uh, for any one of you who are not familiar with graph neural networks, here's a very brief um, introduction. Here we have three nodes and four directed edges. And the node set contains three nodes and edge set contains these four directed edges. We use for each one of this edge, directed edge, we have an edge encoder that have this, that give us edge representation. And for each one of the nodes, we aggregate all the edge representation on the incoming edges. And together with the information on the nodes, we get this node representation. Sometimes we have to do these things iteratively to um, propagate the information multiple steps over the graph. But in general, the edge encoder are shared and the node encoder are shared. So it is a very nice way to capture inductive bias underlying the system. And in, in the paper, I also have introduced several uh, augmented um, treatments to make it better. For example, we use multi-step effect propagation and also dynamically build the graph to make sure like the, the edge doesn't get too, the edge set doesn't get too large as well as use some hierarchies to more effectively propagate the effects. And also for different types of objects we are using different treatments, for example, rigid body, um, usually all the particles are moving in a way that are constrained within a rigid motion. So we use hierarchical modeling together with predicting the global motion for deformable objects. We are using hierarchical modeling and we are predicting local motion for each one of the particles. And for fluids, we use dynamic graph building and also predicting local motion for each one of the fluid particles. And here is a result of uh, the forward prediction using our model where a block of fluid is interacting with a rigid object. And the only information for the model, the input to the model is the initial position and velocity of each one of the particles. Here we also compare with the ground truth simulators uh, between the ground truth simulator as well as our model. <coughs> Here, like fluid dropping as well as clipping some deformable materials as well as shake a box of fluid. And because the graph neural networks nicely captures inductive bias between the interactions of the particles. So our model can naturally generalize to more particles than during training. Here are showing that our model trained on a specific number of particles can, can, can generalize to two times more particles. The performance is, is not like perfect, but it is uh, reasonable in a sense and can capture the wave of the fluid. And it is useful for us to do some downstream control task. But how can we do control? The learned model is naturally differentiable because it is a neural network where you can uh, directly extract the gradients using the, the packages. And we can apply model predictive control and using gradient descent to solve for the optimization, to solve for the trajectory optimization. Here's the animation of it. We have our initial state x0 and our goal showing red. Maybe we have some initial guess of what the action sequence should be. And we use our learned model to predict the final states by execute, after executed our action sequence. And we back propagates the loss between our model's prediction as well and together with the target goal and to optimize for the control signals and to drive our goal closer to the, to drive our, our predictions closer to the goal. And as you have seen, like model may not always be accurate enough. So we usually execute the first action U0 to get, give us new states and re-optimize you using gradient descent, like each time we forward uh, into the futures and use the new states as a feedback to correct our, uh, our action sequences. And here are some results. Here, our target is to shake this box of fluid to match this target shape when the countdown goes to zero because we cannot really stabilize over that shape. Here's another example. And here is to uh, grip this deformed material to give us this target uh, shape. The actions here are the position, orientation, and clipping distance of this uh, simulated gripper. Here's another example. And also apply this, um, this kind of techniques to the real world. Here we want to mold these deformable materials into this target shape. 
And by, if you want to think how we can apply this to the real world, there are actually two things we have to care about. The first one is how can we estimate the state? And what we are doing is to, we first have a depth camera that give us the surface of these objects. And we sample particles within the surface as our, um, initial, as our positions of those particles and use that particles to, uh, to come up to synthesize the control signals. Here you can see like the results uh, is not perfect, but it's somewhat, it, you can get the sense that this model is trying to do something that is reasonable and can really uh, see what kind of actions can drive this kind of deformable materials closer to the goal. And here are another two simpler examples where we are want to mold these deformable materials into some <coughs> more regular shapes. Here's another example uh, to make it a tilted shape. Admittedly, humans can do this task much better, uh, but with a more dexterous head and more uh, uh, sensing modalities. Uh, so there's still room for us to improve and maybe hopefully one day we can use this kind of grippers, general robot to make sushi. <laughs> Using particles as a representation of the environments um, has, has been drawing a lot of attention. This is not a new idea. Uh, a lot of people in the graphics community have been using particles as a, uh, as a way of representing the object around us. And recently it has gained some attention from the machine learning communities. Um, here is a concurrent work from uh, Stanford where they are also building hierarchical graph to predict the uh, particles uh, movements as well as some follow-up work uh, from Intel as well as DeepMind, where they are really scaling up this kind of framework to a uh, more diversified or larger scale like fluid environments. Uh, but they haven't shown any control uh, results. Uh, so I guess some of the results in our paper in terms of control are still uh, something that may worth looking at. <clears throat> then a brief recap for what I've been talking about here, like still like the uh, the optimization we want to solve. And the state representation is using particles. The dynamics model is using graph neural networks. And the policy is to use gradient descent plus model predictive control to both solve for the trajectory optimization problems as well as um, getting feedbacks from the environment. Always, there are some limitations of this kind of approach. The first, it is in general a hard problem to estimate the particle locations directly from measurement data, like for example, from vision. Although I have shown an example where we mold these deformable uh, materials, but we also make some assumptions. For example, we assume like this object is homogeneous within, but what if it is composed of different components or different like um, shapes of different materials? In general, estimating the particles uh, from measurement data is, is challenging. Second, using particles is not always necessary because if you think about rigid objects, its motion is constrained by a six dog pose you don't have to use like thousands of particles or hundreds of particles to represent the state of these objects. So for different objects, you may want to use different representation. For fluid, you may want to use like a lot of particles, but for a lot of like daily objects, particles may not be super necessary. Although it is a nice combination if you think about how we can get depth cloud from the uh, sensor data. But this kind of like redundant representations sometimes will uh, prevent you from uh, coming up with very efficient like control methods because it is has a very high state dimension because the dimension of a state is lin scaly, scales linearly with the numbers of particles. So following up with this method, uh, this approach, we're thinking about reducing the numbers of particles, which essentially somewhat closer to key points. Key points is, has been studied a lot, especially in the computer vision communities. People are using key points to represent like uh, humans, uh, bodies and human faces, as well as um, representing like objects. The nice things about key points, it is it can provide category level generalizations. Like we humans are in different shapes, are different height, different ways, but key points are still in general, a good way to capture the invariance between different humans. Also, like for example, shoes. Shoes are also, like, as well as marks, they have different shapes. If you use mesh plus six dog poles, it is very hard to align them. 
like how you align those two meshes in a way that is semantically meaningful. But key points have these nice properties where tip, shoe tip is, is close to shoe tip, like mark bar is close to mark bar. And we want to apply this kind of key points uh, as a representation for some like real world manipulation tasks. And the task is we are considering is uh, planner pushing and the key points we want to really learn these kind of key points from observation data in an unsupervised way without having to uh, extensively label um, by human. And first I'm gonna talk about how we can get the unsupervised key points. We follow the work also developed in Rust lab where um, the work is called dense object nets. It is a way of to learn this kind of dense descriptors from average RGBD data, uh, where you can see like this kind of color very nicely capture the semantics of different shoe, different marks or different hats. Although the color of the shoe, the hat, the marks are different, but these descriptors nicely um, captures the semantics of directly from visual images. And the way to learn it is to buy, you have this very nice depth cameras, you do 3D reconstruction of the environment. And for each depth point in the reconstruction, you can back project that point to each one, to the pixels of the collected image. So you can get the correspondence. But by using the correspondence, you can uh, formulate positive, positive pairs and uh, negative pairs and use contrastive learning to learn this kind of dense descriptor. And here we are showing the nice tracking performance of this, of this correspondence results. Here on the left image, you are, we are, you are seeing that, that we are moving the mouse, hovering the mouse over the objects. And in the middle, you are seeing a heat map of the corresponding um, uh, locations, like because you have the input image or, or target image. You map the input image to the descriptor space. You map the target image to the descriptor space. You hover your mouse in the input image. You, you get the query descriptor and you convolve that query descriptor in the target image to get generate this kind of heat map where the higher uh, confidence value means that it's closer to your hover points. This way you will see like, although this is a different time step, also even in some, sometimes in different viewpoints, it can still give you very nice correspondence. And this could be a way of facilitate downstream dynamics learning. Because if you want to learn dynamics, you really have to know like how each point or how the object moves across time. So this kind of dense descriptors can give us very, this kind of very nice correspondence across time. And by learning the dynamics model, here you are showing like the green lines shows the actual key point movements and the blue lines shows the predictive key point movements. The way to reduce from the dense descriptor to the key point space was by very simple sampling. You sample from the descriptor space to get this reduced order representation of the original uh, image space. And after you have this like reduced number of key points, you can learn a model on it. And it doesn't have to be a very fancy model. Um, here we are just using multi-layer perceptions and it is very efficient to execute. And after we have this model, how, how are we do control? In this work, we are using the MPPI model predictive pass integral. The idea is, is also very, very simple. It is a sampling based uh, methods where it first have some initial action sequences and it samples some new action sequences by augmenting the initial sequence, action sequence by adding noise, such as you will have the distributions of possible uh, rollouts. And you evaluate each one of the action sequence by see how well each one of the rollouts use the learned model matches your goal. And you reweight action sequences uh, after, uh, uh, according to the rewards and repeat this process. And the key for this to succeed, because it, it has to be based on sampling, uh, it doesn't uh, directly use a gradient from the model. So the key for it to work is actually to leverage the GPUs because the, because the, the learned model is a neural network it can be parallelized very nicely using GPUs. So you can simultaneously sample like thousands of rollouts in order for you to find a good um, trajectory. And here we are showing some results of pushing this box 
to some target location. And here we are showing a slightly challenging like uh, trajectory. Here we are showing um, a, a very nice like byproduct of this MPC method because it can directly handle uh, mode switch. Usually mode switch is a challenging problem in the robotics field because like there's a very strong like nonlinearities, uh, actually discontinuities in the process. But uh, using our nerd model and as well as coupled with a model predictive control framework, we are able to um, handle these mode switches as well as um, uh, perform, provide some robustness over external disturbances. Uh, and we are also here showing like our method is robust to some backgrounds uh, clusters that the learn descriptor is fairly robust to um, varying backgrounds. And here we are showing like, uh, we are not cherry picking the, the, the results and we are showing like a success push uh, 10 times in a row without any like cutting. To brief recap, like in this work, uh, we are using unsupervised key points as the state representations. And we are using multi, very simple multi-layer perceptions, actually very, very small percept, uh, uh, MLP to model the dynamics. And we are using like sampling based uh, uh, model predictive controls to, to come up with the control signals. Also, there are some limitations of this works. If the results are nice, you are seeing like very nice and robust pushing uh, behavior. Uh, but in general, if you think about like more complicated objects uh, where the task becomes uh, more challenging and more complicated, key points as a representation might be about a little bit lossy because you are actually reducing the whole image into these nice key points. The nice things about it is the, the dimension is very low, but you are ignoring the information like for example, the geometric information between the key points. And you have to rely on interactions between your robots and the objects in order to figure out what's between the object and how you can implicitly embed that kind of knowledge inside your neural network. And also uh, for key points, it's still a little bit hard to handle partial observable scenarios where you usually assume like the key points is somewhat um, complete. Uh, but not really complete, but somewhat captures the things that are important uh, for the tasks. But for partial observable scenarios, it is, it is still uh, like a challenge for a lot of like um, robotics people. Uh, here I'm showing a very simple example where the goal would be to push this pile of boxes to these target locations, but we are only gets the observation from the top. You can see this is a camera view from the top to the bottoms. And only the orange or the red boxes are observable. All the blue boxes are not uh, directly observable from the cameras. But why is it a challenge? Because partial observable scenarios can have ambiguities in terms of how the environment is gonna evolve. For example, for these two like, kind of configurations, the observation is exactly the same because here we are assuming only the orange boxes are observable. But for the left videos, uh, the, the, the pile of boxes will stable. But for the right, the boxes will drop down. So people are coming up with ways to directly learn from sensory inputs without having to have some abstract intermediate representations by using latent space where you directly map the observation data, for example, images into this kind of latent space and learn a dynamics model over this latent space. Over the past few years, there has been uh, a lot of like advances in this kind of directions where people are directly mapping the images into latent space 
and do model based um, uh, reinforcement learning with it. Sometimes they use um, a directly using sampling, sometimes they're using policy search. But in general, they are learning this kind of latent space directly from images. And uh, in a paper we pu uh, published in I I ICRA 2019, uh, we are also mapping the observation data directly to the latent space and our dynamics model over this latent space. We differ from them is that we uh, also incorporate the compositional structures of the observation data. But let's say like, we represent the environments as a lot of like nodes and we want to model the interactions using graph neural networks. And this is the original one where we assume we are directly operating on the key point space or operating on the particle space. But now we are mapping them to some latent space and there are latent space dynamics model. Because we assume the things environment are unobservable, so we aggregate information over a time window to, ac to accumulate, to infer actually some of the hidden information that are embedded uh, in inside this hidden environment. And here, as a, here is a more like graphical illustration of it, where the original one, we directly predict like the change of the states, like change of the key points or change of the particles, now we're mapping it to some latent space and our latent space dynamics model. Um, but for learning this kind of latent space dynamics model have challenges because uh, we are using graph to model the compositionalities of the environments and the observabilities may change over time. For example, for sometimes uh, some nodes becomes invisible and, and then next time step, this nodes becomes observable again. And the number of the, observer, of the number of observable nodes also changes over time. So we have some specific treatments in the paper. I won't go into the details, but I, you get the general idea and some of the challenges that we are facing. And the control is also um, the same as the one I show in the particle works. We are using the gradient descent to optimize for the control signals and apply model predictive controls to, to feedback, to get feedback from the environments. And here are some results. Here the task is to uh, push this pile of boxes to achieve this target configuration when the constant go to zero. And the bottom left uh, video you are showing that it has to spread over a larger range. So it has to push a little bit more aggressively. And the bottom right, it is showing a video where uh, the goal is more is closer. So it has to push uh, more conservatively. Uh, these are all nice results. Uh, one thing that we still like uh, want to push for is to simplify the model because now the model is still a uh, very nonlinear and, and very complicated neural networks. Optimizing through this kind of neural network is still very, very challenging. And we are currently relies on either gradient descent or using some sampling based method to optimize for the control signals. We reinforce learning or model free reinforcement learning basically is also using like sampling based method by sampling from the ground truth like simulator or the ground truth environments. So this kind of optimization method is somewhat um, unsatisfying in a way that is uh, not very efficient and prone to some local optimal. Is it possible to make the dynamics linear, especially if we have already mapped the, the observation data to this kind of high dimensional latent space? And this is a nice work called Kuhlman operator theory, where they assume like you can map this, this state space like XT to some higher dimensional uh, Kuhlman operator space like GXT. And over this operator space, the dynamics becomes linear, where K is like a linear matrix and the U is the uh, actions that are injected into uh, the systems that has linearly linear effects over the evolutions of this uh, operator uh, embeddings. And we combine this strong idea with graph neural networks to capture the compositionalities of the underlying environments by first mapping the, the, the state space into this object centric embeddings and to learn this kind of uh, Kuhlman transition matrix as well as a control matrix uh, to give us the embedding as the next time step and also decode it to to, uh, to decode it to get the next uh, states. This kind of like encoder decoder network can ensure like the intermediate Kuhlman embeddings are not trivial. By doing this, we can have very nice way of identify the 
the dynamics as well as coming up with control signals because the dynamics in, is linear. Linear systems are usually um, are much easier to work with. And here I'm showing <coughs> some results of us manipulating a rope. And one thing to notice is that in all these like six uh, examples you are seeing, the length of the rope is different. That indicates our ability to capture the comp composition entities, as well as the gravity, as well as the uh, steepness of the rope are also different for each one of these examples. So our model has to perform online adaptations. Online adaptations for linear model is easy. It is just a least square regressions using the observation data. And in terms of the control, because the dynamics is linear, which means like the constraint is linear. And if the optimization, like the objective function is quadratic, this is basically a quadratic programming. So both the online adaptation as well as the control synthesis using the linear model are very, very efficient and can adapt to like here, the ropes of different lens as well as different stiffness. Here we are showing like soft robots of different like stiffness as well as different configurations. Here, like the red boxes indicating that this soft box is contracting. The green box is indicating like the boxes is expanding. And here you can see the dark gray means that this is a rigid, rigid cube. And the light gray indicating that this is a soft cube but without any actuation inside. Here we are also showing like, like swimming robots swimming into some target configurations. So <clears throat> this kind of combination between like Kubernetes operators, operator, operator theory and graph neural, net, neural network can give up this nice combination between both compositionality as well as efficient solve for the adaptation as well as the, as well as the control uh, problems. Okay, let me brief recap what you have seen so far. Like it's all uh, coming down to these three key questions. How we want to use, how we want to represent states and what should be the dynamics model and how we want to come up with the control signals. We are showing you like particles, key points, as well as some latent vectors. And for dynamics model, we are thinking about uh, simple MLP graph neural networks or graph neural network with some linear constraints in the middle. And for the policies, you can think of gradient descent. And if it has a linear constraints in the middle, you can use quadratic programming. And or, or you can use samplings to coming up with some control signals if the model is non-linear. And, and stabilize the trajectory using like model predictive control. And the take home message here is that after all these my experiences working with different representation and different dynamics models, my lesson is there may not exist one representation that is suitable for all tasks. If you think about like uh, robots, uh, soft robots, robes, or rigid objects, deformable objects, or fluids or granular materials, it is actually very hard to use one holistic represent representation to represent all of them. And we humans, may not also may not have one representation for everything. We also representing objects using different kind of representations. And it's very essential to understand the choices, the, the, the advantage and limitations between behind different choices, such that we can, uh, given a specific task, we can have the best uh, approach to solve it. Um, next, I'm gonna talk about some other directions like besides uh, model based, model uh, based control. Intuitive physics can also be used in some other directions. For example, here I'm going to show you like we are using intuitive physics to do causal discovery. Like causal discovery is at the core of human intelligence. Like we can uh, infer the interactions between different subcomponents within the environment, where the interactions causally affect the behavior of the physical system. For example, if you see the balls moving around you will notice like the yellow ball and the pink ball, they are always maintaining a, a fixed distance. That means maybe there are some like rigid relations like connecting them, but for other, other uh, balls that may be connected with some other relations. We humans can observe the balls and infer the existence of the hidden confounding variables over the edges, like what type of relations between them and whether there are some like uh, continuous parameters over them, like both the uh, discrete parameter indicating the type of the edge, as well as a continuous parameter, for example, the strength or the stiffness of some specific relations. And by building 
this kind of inference models, we can, and we are facing some new environments. We can observe some small sequence, infer this kind of um, hidden variables from these observations and to predict the future. And in our work, uh, we recently got accepted to NURBS. Uh, we want to build this kind of model to directly infer this kind of causal relationship between different subcomponents directly from vision. Uh, the model we proposed is called Visual Causal Discovery Network. It is mainly composed of three components. The first one is the perception module, where we are similar ideas as some of the ideas I have shown before. It extracts unsupervised key points from the images, which is acts as a node in this kind of causal graph. What we call is to perform node discovery. And then we perform structural inference by observe by taking a sequence of key points movements as inputs. We are inferring whether there are relations between each other that is um, more energy to causal discovery to discover whether there is a relation between them and to infer the exogenous variables over those interactions, like the type of the relations as well as the uh, parameters over that relation, both discrete as well as continuous variables. Then we have this dynamics module that is conditioned on this inferred graph. And by giving a new states, we are predicting the movements of all those key points into the future. Here, I'm gonna show you some results. Uh, for the unsurprised key point detections, we are using the methods uh, developed at the mines uh, called transporter which is basically have some intermediates like bottleneck layers that ask the model to assign key points in a way that can best reconstruct the image. But you are only allowed to look at the areas that are around each one of the key points. So you have to really assign those key points in semantic meaningful locations for you to uh, do a good reconstruction as I have shown in the bottoms. And the second row is showing like the unsupervised key point detected for different environments, like for example, for different balls or different fabric shapes. You, you are seeing like, although this model is not trained by having temporal supervisions, this can still nicely have this kind of, uh, it's like a byproduct of this kind of model that can give you this nice temporal uh, correspondence, which is also true for a lot of the work I have shown before, where we have this kind of dense visual descriptors. We do not have explicit temporal supervision, but the neural descriptor uh, maybe it's because of the inductive bias embedded by the convolutional neural network, then give us this very nice temporal correspondence. And we'll be able to um, detect whether there's an edge between them and to infer like the discrete and continuous exogenous variables over the edges. For example, we are inputting uh, like 30 or 40 time steps of input sequences, and we will be able to predict uh, the graph, which is actually very similar to the ground truth uh, interaction graph. Uh, and also the model trained on the five balls can naturally generalize to balls that are environment that has less or more balls than during training because of the inductive bias embedded in the new, in the graph neural network. And for environments like the coast, we really do not really have like the ground truth of how these key points are interacting or how they are relating to each other. This method can very nicely detect the dependency structures between these key points that they know like these two key points has to be connected because they, their, their relations are highly dependent among each other. But for example, the, the sleeves of the two sleeves are not have edges connecting between them because they are moved relatively independently. After you have this graph, you'll be able to like predict the future um, using the neural dynamics model. This is uh, the intuitive physics for uh, causal discovery. We also uh, have works that are using this kind of intuitive physics model for spatial and temporal reasoning. For example, this is an uh, environment we built uh, that is very similar to Clever, but it has dynamics within. And we'll be able to ask questions, like for example, some descriptive questions, of what is the material of the last object to collide with the science cylinders, or some explanatory questions, like what is responsible for the collision of some and some. So this kind of uh, questions really has to uh, let the, really have to ask the model to know what has happened, what are the events that are happening inside these environments. And also we have another two 
actually a little bit more interesting questions. Why is predictive question to ask the model, what's gonna happen next to hallucinate the future as well as counterfactual questions. Like for example, what would have happened if the cyan ball is not there? But what if, what would have happened if some other balls are appear inside this environment? So in order to answer these kind of questions, we really have to understand the dynamics within the environments in order to uh, perform like spatial and temporal reasonings over the physics, physics environments. And we are building um, uh, actually some very straightforward models where we first uh, parse the environment to have like the instance mask of each one of the objects. And we are regarding each one of these objects as a node inside this graph. And we are still using graph neural networks to learn the interactions between different nodes and to predict how the each one of these objects will move in the, into the future. And here I'm gonna show you some results. Here we are predicting like the motion of these balls as well as whether they are colliding or not. And if we are facing a question, like what if the gray ball is removed? Like we can see like this, uh, the left video again. If the gray ball is removed, maybe the, the green cubes will collide with the purple ball and that can be predicted uh, using our model. So by performing this kind of counterfactual reasoning, using our model is very straightforward because like each one of the object is a node inside our dynamics modeling. So in order to model dynamics, we just have to remove one of the nodes such that we can see what's gonna happen um, uh, by still rolling out our dynamics model. And also by coupling with the question parsers and the program executor, we will be able to achieve this kind of uh, question answering with a fairly uh, good uh, performance. Uh, the last uh, project I'm gonna uh, share with you is uh, one paper that we got accepted to Nature, where we are thinking about not just from visual perceptions, but also from other sensory modalities, especially touch. Um, if you think about our daily activities, especially daily interactions between our hands as well as the object around us, we're not only observing um, the change of the states from our vision, we're also feeling the interactions. Uh, the touch can tell you whether you are in contact or not, how much force you're applying, and what are the local contact configurations. And we build this uh, scalable tactile glove that can give us very nice feedbacks of the contacting force over the palm areas of our hand. Uh, this is very sensitive and uh, real time. And we are using this kind of tactile globe to do some downstream tasks. Um, the technology is, is, still, is still, it's actually widely used in the uh, manufacturing communities where we have this kind of force sensitive materials where if you have larger force, the resistance will be decreased. So we have a larger like uh, response. And here we are showing like this globe is scalable and compliant, um, can warp around the surface of our hands without, because a lot of other like tactile sensors are somewhat rigid. It is not uh, straightforward to like bend it as well as um, our sensor can actually capture a very large, re relatively large area of the context. Um, this is all very nice for us to think about our human interaction with the environments. Think about it as a tactile skin to get information from the interactions. And we are collecting data uh, by interacting with a lot of objects and do, for example, like object classification or do hand pose clustering because this kind of tactile sensors can give you response even if your hand pose is, 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 is just that your hand pose is changing. And we'll also be able to get very nice like results by looking at the correlation between different sensors. They can tell us how we human use our hands. Here, like when we hover the mouse over some areas, the other heated areas telling you how those areas uh, are, how high the correlation is between other areas with the sensors you are choosing. For example, if you are choosing the fingers, you'll be, you be able to see like other fingers are lined up telling us like when we human use our hands, usually our fingers are used together. 
this would be very useful for us if you think about uh, building tools or think about building prosthetic tools um, for humans or for the robot to actually interact with the world. Okay, now it goes to the summary. Um, today I told you guys about using first intuitive physics for model-based control. I have talked about like different representations, like for example, particles, key points, as well as latent vectors, uh, and, and also like image patches to model the environment in a compositional way, and also different representations for different materials. And we are using different dynamics model uh, for modeling at different, um, by, by giving it different assumptions, and also like different action, uh, different ways of synthesizing action sequences to actually achieve goals for different like tasks. Uh, these are all very important if we really want to uh, deploy this kind of robot in the real world interacting with the environments. And second part is about intuitive physics for physical reasonings. I talk about how it can be used for causal discovery as well as to perform uh, spatial temporal reasoning for visual question answering. And uh, we are also building like tactile glove to give us better information uh, inside this robot environment interactions. Uh, by telling us like more information. And the lessons I learned is model is important and try using the model whenever possible. And before the end of talks, I would like to show these videos again. These are really, really amazing talks, like how amazing our humans can do. And these are far beyond the reach of the current robots. And my grand goal is to really build a robot so they can close the gap between the manipulation skills between the human and the robots. And last, I would like to thank all my collaborators um, that can help us throughout the process. Without them, it won't be, many of the projects won't be enough like this. And thank you all for your participation. Wow, Yunzu, that was fantastic. I'm very new to the area and I was very impressed. So before we move to questions, let's all unmute ourselves and uh, th thank the speaker. Uh, Thanks. Okay, cool. So we have about, yeah, we, we have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So yeah, uh, feel free to raise your hand, uh, enter on the chat or even unmute yourself and, and ask a question. I have a few questions myself, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait for others first. Yeah. Um, uh, Professor Barto? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can yeah, hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the very nice talk. That was, uh, that was great. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, can those control uh, methods scale to larger numbers of degrees of freedom of the control, like hand manipulation with fingers and, uh, uh, you know, doing, doing uh, the kind of manipulation that we do with our hands. Have you, have you scaled to that level in terms of the effector degrees of freedom? Um, yes, uh, in a sense like for the particle dynamics, actually the dimension of the state is very, very high, actually uh, much higher okay. than, the, than, than, the, than, the, than the hands. But we okay. also observe some scalability issues because we cannot uh, get very, very efficient control uh, results by dealing with these levels of like uh, degrees of freedoms. But since our, our in a positive sign is that not everything is in GPU. So you can basically do sampling or doing gradient descent using different seeds or different initializations by directly operating it on the GPUs. Those uh -huh. are something that's also, I guess, uh, gives a success to a lot of like model free reinforcing learning uh, in the algorithms in the communities. Uh, but in the future, we are also pushing the direction of to give more assumptions over the model class, such as solving for the control signals actually is more efficient and more effective. Because if you rely everything on samples, it won't be able to solve very complicated, especially procedural tasks. Now, things are more like, re re like reactive. So things are, can still have a reasonable performance. But if you think about like uh, open a door, place a mug inside it, Doing a lot of samples may not be the most reasonable thing to do. Uh -huh. So we are kind of adding assumptions. Like for example, in the work I showed, I we are adding like this kind of linear assumptions. We are also thinking about other model classes that we can enforce to this kind of intuitive physics model, such that the control synthesis becomes more easy and more uh, effective. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. One one more question. So uh, the the Koopman operator theory, 
Is, is, is it, um, I mean, is there a procedure for uh, generating the space in which the nonlinear dynamics are linear? How is that done? Or is that, I, I don't know how, what information you need to create that higher dimensional space. Yes, yes. Um, for the Kuhn operator theory, the original, the original theory tells us like for any like uh, differentiable systems, differentiable to a certain numbers of degrees for this kind of systems, you will always be able to map from the state space to an infinitely dimensional Hilbert space. Okay. Then over that Hilbert space, you will, you will have this kind of like linear properties. But okay. we cannot work with infinite dimensional space. So people usually find a finite dimensional approximation of this infinite dimensional space. So it's like the kernel trick in pattern classification. Yeah, yeah, similar. Sim very that. similar. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. The talk. Thank you for the questions. Okay, so we have uh, Emily next. Um, you, you, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, uh, I just had a question about um, what specific manipulation tasks you were focusing on. I recognize obviously generalization is key and you, if you had a robot that could do everything, that'd be awesome. But um, are there any specific tasks or type of tasks that you kind of have, you prefer to do or prefer to work on? Yes, yes. Um, actually from the beginning, because like in Rust lab, we are focusing on robotics and he was working on the humanoid robots. And when we switch uh, to the manipulation domain, we think a lot about what should be the task that we're focusing on. And the first task we are actually focusing on was like grasping. But it turns out grasping is not a particularly challenging problem if you give it enough assumption. In a sense that if you have a depth camera, you have a good reconstruction of the environment around you. Um, by doing anti pedal like detections, you detecting like this parallel points such that your gripper can can grasp on, can already give, get you very, very far. Maybe for example, 95% of the object in, the, in our daily life can, can be already being grasp, grasped, uh, maybe except some like transparent objects or some like metal objects where the depth doesn't uh, work as well. Um, so after we figure out that, we, are, we want to move to more dynamic environment because like for grasping, uh, we are thinking like the room for improvement is not very large and, and if you, Think about grass, it is not a very dynamic task where everything is reasonably quasi static in a sense like you do not have to know like uh, the second order terms of the, of, of the environment. So the first things uh, we are considering in terms of um, having more dynamics is, is pushing. Like I have shown in the, uh, in the key points into the future work where we are doing this kind of box pushing tasks. And we are also thinking about um, uh, deformable objects, like I have shown in the first work, like granular materials, um, as well as, um, because for each category, like for granular materials, you can think of like great objects of different granularities, like coffee beans or like um, or onion, onion, onion chops, or some <clears throat> more larger objects or a, a pile of cubes. And uh, for deformable objects, you can also think about like for example, row for clothes, as well as some like rice, this kind of things. Um, in general, we are thinking about if you for rigid object want to make it more dynamic, or we want to like uh, tackle like deformable or more complicated like object class. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next we have uh, Professor Silva. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks for the awesome talk. That was really really interesting. Um, I have a question about the first method that you that you described, where you represent the state as a set of particles, and then you use MPC to uh, mm -hmm. decide which actions you're going to execute. I was wondering if you could comment on um, if you have any uh, views on whether this is applicable in real uh, time problems. Because if you're doing MPC, you're basically doing planning all the time, and you're resampling different trajectories. And if, but if you have to pick actions really fast, I don't know if how feasible that is compared to, for example, actually learning a policy in closed form that you can actually, you can just query the policy as a distribution over, over actions instead of having to do a resample all the time. That, that's a very good question. Like we do uh, face this kind of scalability issues or the efficient issues where we apply this kind of method in the real world. 
So actually, if you remember that videos, it is actually a procedure task where you are not like constantly moving your gripper to mold it uh, like, like we humans do. Instead, we do it like step by step. We first grab once and we observe again and we grab twice and we observe again. This kind of things, um, some, some, somehow like alleviates the requirements of to make it, to having to make it like real time. But you can still get feedback because between different uh, grips, uh, the, the objects are, are there, not moving. So you will be able to get some feedbacks uh, to correct the, some parameters, for example, some physical parameters inside your model. Um, I do agree this is, uh, in general, if you want, you want to do a gradient descent plus like uh, model predictive control in the real world, particles uh, are still a little bit hard to work with. But in the other uh, points in terms of learning a policy, um, I think learning a policy in a sense, like it is not like a orthogonal direction. Because if we have this kind of learned models, we can still learn a policy using the learned model. It's just that we, have, we do not have to interact with the real environments in order to learn the policies. Having this kind of learned model, you will have better like, um, has every, some other people have shown like, by learning the model, you have better sample efficiency, as well as you will be easier for you to specify goal, um, as well as for you to debug. Because if your method doesn't work, what's now? Uh, you will, you say I have this kind of modules, you will be able to know like what module doesn't work. Is it because of the perception module, the detection of the particles are not accurate enough or because of the dynamics model are not accurate enough or because uh, how you are doing control is not like uh, clever enough. So by having this kind of modular designs, you will be able to have this nice uh, luxury of to debug uh, that that's are not uh, encompassed uh, by our end to end system. Okay, great. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, Matthew. Hi. So um, I was interested in the part where it recognized key points in the mm -hmm. folded uh, clothing, and like the how it sort of was moving around. I was interested. Could it somehow keep those key um, key points if the clothing was say like flipped upside down or something because I don't think we ever saw a key point pass over another so I'm interested in how that would work yeah yeah uh you, you spot a very strong limitations and uh, actually actually very important limitation of that work um but it's not like like key points one passing each other because for the ball environment the, the balls are actually moving around each other so the key points are moving around each other um I guess the key things here like uh regarding the uh the applicability of this method is whether we can make the key points in a 3D space. Because now the key points are mostly still in the 2D, both in the ball environment as well as the closed environment. In both these environments, uh, the key points are not really having kind of depth because we are not folding the clothes. We are still like stretching the clothes to make it into different, uh, slightly different shapes. <clears throat> but given this kind of assumptions, um, uh, 2D key points may be enough, but if you want to uh, uh, goes over to some more complicated scenarios where you have like 3D geometry, you have this kind of occlusion or folding, this kind of actions. Uh, what I really want is to have very nice 3D uh, representations. It could be somewhat similar to a sparser, sparsified particles, particle sets, uh, but some more work needs to be done to give us better representation. It's like all these components, like all the way from like the perception, like the, the space representation, the dynamics model as a control has more room to improve, to make the whole systems uh, more applicable to more complicated uh, environments uh, in the real world. Thank Does you. that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we, we still have about five minutes. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, uh, put it on the chat. Okay, so I I had one question about the causal discovery of states. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I think it was a causal discovery of the rigidity between particles. I think the New Rips twenty twenty work. So yeah, I I come from an NLP background. I was just wondering like what was this like how much inductive bias or domain specific was that method? Because in in in, in NLP we have this important problem that uh, while we while you're very good at predicting the next word, we don't know why these predictions are made, and there's a lot of work in like figuring out like 
is a model learning some some kind of structure or um, yeah yeah I just better wanted to understand like like how domain specific the the, the method was. Okay. Yep. Um, it's basically drives down to what are the assumptions that we make to the systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, the assumption we make is first we have to specify now, at least for now, it is a limitation of the perception module. We have to specify how many nodes are there inside these systems. And I usually, typically, I will like experiment it with several different choices and choose the one that performs the uh, visually, heuristically, seemingly performs the best. The second assumption that we have is in the inference module, where we have to specify how many relations are there for the models to decide from. Because if you are given like too many choices, the model may decide, oh, even if they are the same relation, for example, they are the same rigid relation, I have the luxury to uh, use, like to assign two classes with it. So you will have some kind of, it, it's like you are doing some kind of clustering. You want to choose how many modes are there inside this kind of uh, data sets. Um, Besides that, I guess if you have a good structured models of your environments and there are some hidden confounding variables you want to infer and you have a target goal that are actually heavily uh, affected, affected by this kind of hidden confounder, I guess you will have some nice results by trying this kind of framework. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that was useful. Thanks. Um, um, in, any other questions? Okay, so let's unmute ourselves once again and thank the speaker. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I'll just stop recording.